OK, so uh, welcome to lecture nine. I'd like to tell you about convexity and convex geometry in the setting of tropical geometry. So let's start with the definition. So let's say S is any subset of R to the N. I'm going to say that subset is tropically convex. <coughs> if the following holds, if X and Y are elements in this set, and A and B are any real numbers, then this implies that the corresponding tropical linear combination AX plus BY is also in the set. So A times X is the usual scalar times vector multiplication carried out tropically, and then the plus is the, uh, the minimum coordinate wise of two vectors. So I'm going to say a subset of R to the N is tropically convex if it is closed in the tropical linear combinations. Now notice that uh, such a set, if we classically add in the all one vector, then this is also contained in S, right? Because uh, in particular, this uh, allows for the possibility of just multiplying A with X, so B is very, very large, just like uh, additive neutral element. So in particular, S always contains the line through the origin, or has it in its linearity space. So for that purpose, it is convenient to gain one dimension. And we always draw our pictures in the n minus one dimensional space. So we work in Rn mod the all one vector. So without loss of generality, when we draw a convex set, we'll work in this quotient. In practice, we will maybe set the last coordinate to be zero, right? We're going to tropically scale and set the last coordinate to be zero. The tropical convex hull of a set is the smallest tropically convex set containing the given set. So we're particularly interested in the convex hull of a finite set. So if you have a finite subset of R to the N, then this smallest convex, tropically convex set containing this is called a tropical polytope. Another way to say this, the tropical polytope is a semi-module, a sub-semi-module, finally generated sub-semi-module of R to the N with respect to the tropical operation. So let's uh, use the notation T-conv for the convex hull, tropical convex hull of R vectors V1 up to VR. And it's easy to check that that's simply A1 times V1 plus, 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 AR times VR, where the multipliers are arbitrary real numbers, A1 up to AR. And just to drive the point home, we always regard this in the n minus 1 dimensional space, R1 modulo scaling. Okay? So this is a tropical polytope. The tropical convex hull in this n space, or in this n minus 1 space, of r given points. Now equivalently, this is the image of an r by n matrix. Right? So it's the usual image under right multiplication of an r by n matrix in the sense of linear algebra, arithmetic carried out tropically. So one place where this arises is in the spectral theory. Right? So if we look at the eigenspace of a square matrix, so if we have an n by n matrix, then you can find this discussion in section 5.1. There's also a section in introduction invitation to nonlinear algebra. There's a basic theorem that says every n by n matrix has precisely one eigenvalue. Every n by n matrix has precisely one eigenvalue. Tropically, so there is a corresponding eigenspace, and this eigenspace is a tropical polytope. And there is a, a simple algorithm for computing a representation as a convex polytope. Let's uh, look at an example. So this is figure 521 from the book. 
So here both n and r are 3. So this would be, we call a tropical triangle, right? So we plot three points with their homogeneous coordinates in the plane. And uh, let me do this in yellow. So the picture that you see looks roughly like this. So there are three points, this point, that point, and that point. So here the point is 0, 0, 1. The last point is 0, 2, 0. I guess here my convention is I homogenize the first coordinate to be 0. So in the book this is 2, 1, 0, which is really the same as 0, minus 1, minus 2, if I tropically multiply by negative 2. So then this is the, whoops, yeah, so this is the point 0, 1 in the plane. This is the point 2, 0, and this is the point negative 1, negative 2. Now the convex hull between these two points is this segment. These two points is this bend segment down there. And then if I continue taking convex hulls, it also fills out this triangle, right? So this is a typical picture of a tropical triangle in the plane. So this picture is in R2, which is R3 mod R1, with the normalization that the first coordinate is always zero. Okay, so that's how you draw a triangle in the plane. You can start by taking line segments, right? So if you have two points in the line, in the plane, they span a unique line, and then there's an obvious line segment between them on that line. First theorem is 5, 2, 3, which says that intersections, so this has several statements, some easy, some less easy, intersections of tropically convex sets are also convex. It's relatively straightforward from the definition. So you intersect convex sets, you get convex sets. Coordinate projections preserve convexity. So if you project from n-dimensional space onto a subspace by just dropping some of the coordinates, this preserves tropical convexity, but general linear projections do not, right? Because that would be a multiplicative operation. So a coordinate projections preserve con convexity, but uh, classical linear maps in this setting will not preserve convexity because they would be the tropicalization of an ohmial map, a toric map, which also classically doesn't preserve convexity. Some classical hyperplanes, root hyperplanes, are convex. So the classical hyperplane of the form xi minus xj is some fixed constant k. Such hyperplanes are tropically convex. So by this I mean you fix a real number k and you look at all the n vectors x such that xi minus xj is equal to k. So xi minus xj, the roots of type a n minus 1. So these classes, these particular, very particular classical hyperplanes tend to be tropically, are tropically convex. Other classical hyperplanes are not. Uh, and last fact, so tropically convex sets are contractible as a topological space. So that's again a reasonable condition, right? Convex sets should be topologically trivial. And you can see this space, right? This comes with a natural subdivision. There's one triangle. There's six edges, one-dimensional cells. And then there are six zero-dimensional cells. So if I stick a little additional vertex here, this is a polyhedral complex with f vector six, six, one. And the support is a contractible set. It has trivial topology, but it's not equidimensional. You can see some top dimensional cells are two dimensional, and some of them are one dimensional. 
Now, when people see this for the first time, they're a little bit uh, confused, right? Because why is this called a convex set? You might wonder if it's the image of a matrix, shouldn't it be a linear space, right? So when you see this for the first time, why are these called convex sets? Well, images of matrices here are not, under linear maps, are not linear spaces. Linear spaces are more subtle. Linear spaces we discussed the last week, and uh, they're quite subtle. They require quite a bit of practice to compute linear spaces. So these things are called polytopes. And let me give you one motivation why they are called polytopes. This is remark 524. Well, because they're images of classical polytopes under tropicalization, right? Tropicalized linear spaces are precisely the images of classical linear spaces under the valuation map. Tropical linear spaces are almost that. They look like tropicalized linear spaces. So they are a shadow of classical linear spaces. But tropical polytopes really mirror classical polytopes. So let's pick the field of real Prezor series, where the uh, generator is called epsilon. So these are Prezor series with real coefficients and the generator epsilon. So these are formal power series in one unknown, transcendental unknown epsilon with rational exponents and uh, a mild condition on those rational numbers. So this is not an algebraically closed field. It's a real closed field, but it's an ordered field. Right? So you can order this if you think about epsilon as a small positive quantity, very small positive quantity, as you do in calculus. Then this is an ordered field. And with this ordered structure, it's a real closed field. So it has index 2 in its algebraic closure, which is the familiar Pezor series. So over this ordered field, we can speak about classical convex polytopes. And this remark says that the images of classical convex polytopes in, well, I'd like to say k to the n, but for technical reasons, we're going to take k plus to the n under the valuation map, coordinate-wise valuation map, are tropical polytopes, well, in Rn or Rn mod R1, right? So if you have a, so here by K plus, I mean the strictly positive field elements, right? So I'm sticking my classical polytope in the positive orthant in uh, K to the N, and that's for technical reasons, so to avoid cancellation, right? So I want to avoid cancellation and then I take a classical polytope, a perfectly good octahedron here, any polytope you want. You apply the, uh, apply the uh, coordinate-wise valuation map, and you get precisely a tropical polytope. And the converse is true as well. So there is a kind of a fundamental theorem for convex polytopes, um, very much in the spirit of the fundamental theorem for very affine varieties, just easier. OK, a couple more facts about uh, tropical polytopes or line segments. I already alluded to this. So proposition 525 says that a line segment, so a tropical segment in Rn mod R1. So by a segment, I mean the convex hull of two points. So if I have two points in Rn, and I take the tropical convex hull and I draw it mod tropical scaling. Then this is the concatenation of at most n minus 1 ordinary line segments. each with uh, 0, 1 slope. So each of these ordinary line segments has a slope given by a 0, 1 vector. Okay? So for example, if I'm in three-dimensional space and I took, take two points, then they lie, they span a unique line, which I'm acting out for you. Right? So this unique line is my arms, my torso, and my legs. 
take a point here on my right arm, take a point here on my left toe, you can see that the convex hull, the line segment, goes along the arm, along the body, down there, three line segments, and n is four, right, because we're working projectively in, in R4 mod R1. So a tropical line segment is the concatenation of classical line segments, and we saw this here, so in the plane, they were concatenations of two yellow classical line segments to make, make a tropical segment. Well, many of the familiar results from ordinary convexity hold true, so let me uh, tell you some. So, for example, Cara Theodori's theorem. Cara Theodori's theorem holds. This is a proposition 527. So, Cara Theodori says the following if you are in some space, and you have many points, and you have uh, another point in the convex hull of those many points, then it's already in the convex hull of few points. So if you have a point cloud on the plane, and you have a point in the convex hull, then it's already in the convex hull of three of them. Or if you have 100 points in three space, they make a polytope, pick a point inside, then you can find four out of the 100 points that have this extra point in the convex hull. That's called Cara Theodori's theorem. And that theorem holds here true as well, or verbatim. Linear spaces are convex, unsurprisingly. So tropical linear spaces, they are convex. They are tropically convex. That's proposition 5 to 8, as they should, right? The linear space should be convex. And in fact, it's quite advantageous to think about a tropical linear space as a polytope. To make this uh, literally true, we have to work with the extended real numbers. We have to throw in plus infinity, the additively neutral element. And then with those plus infinities added in, you can take the co-circuits, place them at infinity, and then every tropical linear space is the convex hull of its co-circuits. So that is, in fact, um, how it's implemented in Polymake, and some of you saw that in Marta Panizut's presentation yesterday. So a tropical linear space is the convex hull of the co-circuits, and it's, of course, the solution of the circuit equation. So circuits cut out linear spaces, convex uh, co-circuits generate them in the sense of convexity. Uh, what else is true? Farkash lemma holds. <clears throat> So that's proposition 5 to 10. Well, Farkash Lemma says if you have two convex sets in some space, if they're disjoint, let's say closed convex sets that are disjoint, you can find a separating hyperplane. Right? So very intuitive, two disjoint closed convex sets can be separated by a hyperplane. The same is true here. So if you have two tropically convex sets that are disjoint, you can separate them by a hyperplane. The only distinction is that the hyperplane divides space not into two connected components, but into uh, n. Right? So a plane, a, a line in the plane, divides the plane into uh, three sectors, and in a plane in three space divides the space into four sectors, and so on. So the separation statement means that they lie in disjoint sectors. So it's a strong form of, of separation. So Farkas theorem holds we have a hyperplane separation. Where the, uh, the role of the half spaces for ordinary hyperplanes is now played by the sectors, right? the n sectors that space is divided into by a hyperplane. Okay, um, it's very good to uh, practice this. So exercise three is to compute the image of a matrix. So compute the image of a tropical linear map. And compute means both compute and draw, right? So 
let's say we take the linear map from R3 to R3 given by some tropical 3 by 3 matrix. So for example, let's take 4, 4, 5, 1, 3, 2, and 1, 3, 4. So that's a typical matrix, right? So I'd like you to compute the image. So the image is the set of all tropical linear combinations of the columns, right? So it's the usual definition of image, except the operations are triple. So this is the convex hull, tropical convex hull of the three column vectors. Well, we draw this picture in the plane by uh, working mod scaling, right? So it's really a linear map from this two-dimensional space to this two-dimensional space. And then it's the same. We might as well decide the last coordinate is normalized to zero. So we can scale the column. So let's scale the first column by negative two, negative one. So we get three, zero, zero. Here we get uh, one, zero, zero. And here we get one, negative two, two. So these are the same column vectors here. And now you simply plot these three points into the plane in yellow and you just draw the line segments and fill in the other pieces and you'll get a tropical triangle. Okay, now a systematic way of producing tropical triangles and tropical convex sets more generally is the following construction that I'd like to explain to you. Here's a systematic way. Let me write C sub V for the subdivision of the ambient space. The ambient space is Rn mod R1. So the subdivision given by the max plus hyperplanes centered at the points in V. Okay, so V is a finite set in R to the n. The goal is to calculate the convex hull. Okay, so you have R points in R to the n. The goal is to calculate the tropical convex hull. So I'm placing a max plus hyperplane with its vertex at each of these points. So I have an arrangement of R max plus hyperplanes in n-dimensional space. So this is uh, given by this picture down here. So for example, if I take a matrix like this, it might happen that the column vectors become this point, this point, and that point, okay? So by a max plus hyperplane, I mean a tropical hyperplane with min replaced by max. So a max plus hyperplane in the is a line in the plane, but now I have a northeastern half ray, a southern half ray, and a western half ray. Okay, so I do attach such a line at each point. Now that divides the plane into convex polygons, bounded and unbounded, and line segments, bounded and unbounded. And I look at the bounded complex. So let me state this. So the theorem is proposition five, two, thirteen that says the tropical polytope which is the tropical convex hull of this finite set V is the union of all bounded cells. Of this subdivision, CV. Okay, so CV is the hyperplane arrangement defined by V in the max plus algebra. We draw this hyperplane arrangement and we focus on the bounded cells, right? So here in this picture, you can see there are 13 bounded cells, six zero-dimensional cells, 
six one-dimensional cells and one two-dimensional cell. Okay, so the bounded complex again has f vector six six one. You can see that the zero cells, the vertices, come in two flavors. There are the yellow vertices of the triangle, so these are the tropical vertices, and then in green there are three auxiliary nodes that just came from the construction. Right? So there are six nodes all together, but the tropical vertices are the fat yellow points, and uh, this is how you build the tropical triangle. Now what about these cells? Well, these cells, of course, will be polytopes, right? Because I take the bounded complex, each cell will be a classical convex polytope, such as this triangle, this line segment, or this yellow zero-dimensional polytope. These are classical polytopes. So what kind of polytopes are there? That's the content of lemma 5 to 15 that says the cells are so-called polytropes. So I'm inserting the letter R, so they're polytropes. And by a polytrope, I mean a convex classical polytope defined by inequalities, inequalities of the form xi minus xj less or equal to cij. So we already saw early on that this hyperplanes, these root hyperplanes, where were they? Over here, we saw early on that the hyperplanes defined by xi minus xj play a special role in tropical convexity, and indeed they do. So if you look at a convex polytope given by inequalities of this form, so I'm placing an upper bound on the difference between any two coordinates. Of course, this would be an unbounded polyhedron in R to the n, but since we're in R to the n mod R1, this will be a compact polytope. And these are called polytropes. In algebraic combinatorics, they're also known as alcoved polytopes. So they've been studied in many, many contexts of pure and applied math. But of course, in this lecture, we believe they are, they are the same. There is no distinction between pure and applied math. So these are polytropes. So they are both classically convex and tropically convex. One more result is proposition 5 to 16. Suppose you have two tropical polytopes. Suppose you have two tropical polytopes in the same ambient space Rn mod R1 then the intersection is also a tropical polytope. Okay? Now this is a slightly non-trivial statement, right? Because I've given you, I've defined the tropical polytopes by a V representation. I told you a tropical polytope is the convex hull of the N R points in N space. I have not given you an H representation. Right? If I've given you, if I had argued that a tropical polytope can be, you know, described as an intersection of half spaces, then this would be a trivial statement. But if you only know your polytopes, as you do here, as the con of the convex hull, then this is a bit of a non-trivial statement. You really have to work with the subdivision that comes from CV, and you have to sort of work your way piece by piece by each polytrope that participates in the subdivision of the polytope. Now having said that, there is a, a H representation. You can represent tropical polytopes also as intersection of half spaces, except they're not half spaces. They're now sectors or unions of sectors, right? So you have to actually use unions of sectors and then intersecting appropriately unions of sectors of hyperplanes. You can also represent tropical polytopes and this gives you a more familiar form as an inequality representation. This, in fact, has been applied to great success in solving a, a long-standing important problem in running time of interior point methods in the classical simplex algorithm. And this was accomplished by Gobert, Joswick, and others 
by tropicalizing linear programming. Indeed, by way of remark 524, you can take a classical linear programming problem, you phrase it over k by introducing a small epsilon into your linear programming formulation, and then you get for free a tropical linear program. That is to say, the problem of optimizing a tropical linear function over a tropical polytope. Now, we looked at tropical triangles, um, but it's good to go up a little bit. Let's also look at tropical quadrilaterals. So let's look at tropical quadrilaterals. And a complete list of types is in the book in figure 5 to 4. Okay, so there are all combinatorial types of tropical triangles. So these are tropical polytopes where n is 3 and r is 4. Tropical convex hull of four yellow points in the tropical plane r3 mod r1. And so there are 35 types and they correspond to something. But before we let them corresponding to something, I think it's instructive to uh, look at these quadrilaterals and intersect them pairwise. So, uh, so a typical quadrilateral looks like this, right? So it's the convex hull of one, two, three, four yellow thick points in the plane. Now again, you can either do this by doing the segments pairwise and iterating, or you can uh, apply the, uh, the algorithm here in this uh, proposition 5, 2, 13, and then you see that a qu tropical quadrilateral has four yellow vertices. In addition, it has six red new vertices, so that 10 zero-dimensional cells, and then there are three two-dimensional cells, and then there's a number of yellow edges dictated by the Euler characteristic. This is a contractible space after all. That's a cooperative. So what I'd like you to do is take the book, Xerox this page, largely, and cut out some of those quadrilaterals, or redraw them, right? And then intersect them pairwise, right? So you make a quadrilateral, you make a quadrilateral, you intersect them, and then you check the uh, proposition that says the intersection is again a polytope. Right? So the question is, you have a quadrilateral with four yellow vertices, somebody else has another quadrilateral with their own four yellow vertices, you intersect them, well, what are the tropical vertices? Right? That's a very good exercise uh, about convex figures in the plane. Now what do they correspond to? The 40, 35 types correspond to, well they correspond to many wonderful objects in geometric and algebraic combinatorics. So it turns out that these types classify very, very interesting things that come up in other contexts. So in particular, they correspond to triangulations, in fact regular triangulations, of products of simplices, delta 2 times delta 3. So this is the standard triangle, two-dimensional simplex. This is the standard tetrahedron, three-dimensional simplex. The direct product is a five-dimensional convex polytope. The five-dimensional Toblerone, the Swiss chocolate, so this convex polytope has uh, 12 vertices, it has uh, seven facets, and so on. So it's always a good exercise to write down the F factors of products of simplices. So get a, get a bar of Swiss chocolate and then uh, generalize its F factor. And I claim that the regular triangulations of the product of an R minus one simplex with an N minus one simplex is classified 
by tropical polytopes. Well, how so? Well, the data for a tropical polytope is an R by N matrix of real numbers. Right? So to specify a polytope, I give you R times N real numbers arranged as a matrix. Use those R times N real numbers, those 12 real numbers, to assign weights to the vertices. Assign these as the weights, those entries of that 3 by 4 matrix whose convex hull you took. Right? This is a 3 by 4 matrix. Use those entries of the 3 by 4 matrix to assign weights of the, to the 12 vertices of our Toblerone. Now the Toblerone is in the five-dimensional blackboard plane. You pull it out according to these heights. You look at the lower convex hull and you get a regular triangulation. That is the correspondence. Right? So a 3 by 4 matrix of real numbers makes a picture like this by proposition 5, 2, 13. It makes a triangulation of this five-dimensional polytope by looking at the lower convex hull. And those are the same combinatorial data. So two triangulations, if you have a matrix and you have a matrix, they will define the same triangulation if and only if these two pictures are the same. And there's a duality, so the 10 vertices here will correspond to the 10 maximal simplices in the triangulation. So in this case, to record this, so this triangulation has 10 maximal simplices, five-dimensional simplices, and three interior tetrahedra. So, uh, so this five-dimensional polytope has a volume 10, has 10 unit simplices in the subdivision. And of course, for the algebraic geometrically or symplectic geometrically inclined listener, this is of course really a, a cartoon for P2 times P3. P2 times P3 in its Segre embedding has degree 10, and that is the same 10. That is the volume here. OK, so let me uh, summarize this discussion in general. That is theorem 5, 2, 19, combinatorial types. of complexes, so the precise statement, so you organize these complexes by combinatorial types that you get by taking R points in Rn mod R1, or in bijection in natural bijection with the regular triangulations of, I'm sorry, with regular, that's not quite correct. Let me fix this with regular subdivisions, actually, polyhedral subdivisions, but it could happen that these weights are special regular polyhedral subdivisions of the product of an n minus 1 simplex and an r minus 1 simplex. OK, and these objects are in bijection with other gadgets that are of interest in, in algebraic combinatorics. Now here's something interesting. There's something curious about this theorem, right? Here in this formulation as triangulations, I have a perfect symmetry in R and N. Right? This product of simplices, if I switch the role of R and N, I get the same object and the same triangulations or subdivisions. However, in this formulation, it looks like R and N play a non-symmetric role. So the next theorem is, uh, aim to resolving this in a somewhat surprising way. So this is theorem 5 to 21. That says the row span of a matrix. 
this is a matrix. This is an R by N real matrix. And you can also take the extended real numbers. So when we wrote the book, we formulated this for the real numbers. I think in the new wonderful book by Michael Joswick on essentials of tropical combinatorics, we immediately work with the extended real numbers together with R plus infinity. And it will also be true, you saw, then we want to realize a tropical linear space as a polytope, convex hull of co-vectors, uh, co-circuits, this is important, but here let me formulate it like this. The row span of a real R by N matrix is equal to its column span. i.e. the tropical complex CV is isomorphic to the tropical complex of uh, its transpose corresponding and this is a affine linear, piecewise linear isomorphism as polyhedral complexes. Now this is shocking news, okay? What I'm saying is that the row space of a matrix is equal to its column space. Not so surprising classically, right? If you have a big matrix of low rank, of course the row space and the column space are equal. They have the same dimension. But here it's somewhat surprising. So let, let's uh, explain this, right? So let's say I look at three by five matrices in tropical geometry. In the tropics. So, so somebody gives you a three by five matrix and that somebody might be me. And I might ask you, draw the convex hull of this matrix. And you might say, well, should I take the convex hull of the five column vectors or should I take the convex hull of the, five, of the three row vectors? And the theorem says they are the same. Okay? So what I'm saying here is that planar pentagons The tropical convex hull of five thick yellow points in the plane is exactly the same as triangles in four-dimensional space. Right? So if I look at my three by five matrix from the point of view of the row vectors, well, I'm really forming a triangle in four space, right? Because the Five coordinates are homogeneous coordinates on R5 mod R1, right? So I'm talking about triangles in four space. And here I'm talking about planar pentagons. They are the same, right? So if you took this quadrilateral, and instead of this quadrilateral, convex hull of four points in the plane, you took the convex hull of three points in three space, you get the same picture. Except the yellow vertices will be somewhere else. They will be here, here, I'm sorry, here, uh, here, and here. Okay? Those, the, the vertices will change. Okay? But as a complex, it's the same. Now this is a very surprising uh, fact and actually quite useful. So uh, as an application, one application is tropical PCA. So principal component analysis is a fundamental technique in classical statistics. So in classical statistics, you have a point cloud and you like to find a linear space of low dimension uh, on which these points project in a graceful manner. That's called PCA, principal component analysis. Well, you can ask the same in tropical geometry. First of all, you need a notion of distance, and there is a natural notion of tropical distance. You need a notion of projection, and uh, what do you project on? Well, you do not project onto a linear space because linear spaces are quite complicated. You project onto images of matrices, that is to say tropical polytopes. So if you have a tropical point cloud, then you are seeking a appropriate small tropical convex polytope on which your points project nicely. And there it is very convenient to have these two interpretations available. You either work with many points in a low dimensional space or with a few points in a high dimensional space. And you can use this duality. This was used to uh, quite successfully in this uh, theory of tropical PCA in applications to phylogenetics. So 
data from molecular biology, work of Yoshida in particular, uh, use this, this kind of duality. Let me end by asking a question. This is exercise 11. How many vertices can a four-dimensional tropical, uh, a four-dimensional polytrope have? Okay. So in the plane, right, a two-dimensional tropical polytrope, polytrope is either a triangle or a quadrilateral, or a pentagon, or a hexagon, right? So the vertices, the, the edges are perpendicular to xi minus xj. These are also called generalized permutahedra. Now in dimension four, I have five coordinates, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. And I have 20 inequalities, xi minus xj, less or equal something, 10 for each ordering. Right? So, ten, so I have 10 pairs, but I go x1 minus x2 is at most 17, and x2 minus x1 is at most 8. So I write down those 20 inequalities, so I get a four-dimensional classical convex polytope with at most 20 vertices. That's a nice exercise to think about how many faces, how many vertices can this have, and what kind of effectors are possible. Okay, so these are polytropes. Polytrope is a classical convex polytope, such as this red hexagon, that is also tropically convex. Now to explore the, uh, the combinatorics, the enumerative combinatorics of the situation, I'd like to point you to corollary 5, 2, 23. And this gives you the face numbers of uh, a general tropical polytope. So if you have a, your R by N matrix is somehow random, right? So that is to say your regular subdivision of the Toblerone is actually a, a triangulation. Then from the combinatorics of that triangulation, you can infer the face number. So if you are interested, if you have a pentagon in the plane or equivalently a triangle in four space and you ask how many edges does this have, well, you can look it up in this corollary. So the number of i-dimensional faces of the tropical convex hull of R points in N space is given by an explicit binomial coefficient formula. Nobody minds if a lecture ends early, so this lecture ends two minutes early. Thanks for your attention and time for questions. Um, could you say more about the <coughs> simplex algorithm that you just um, approximated? Aha, so the question is can I say more about the simplex algorithm? Well, so here is a quadrilateral, right? And uh, you can now look at a, let's say, a tropical linear function. So this is sort of represented by uh, the line, right? So I'm moving the line in a certain direction. And I might be interested in optimizing this at this optimal vertex. So the go north problem is optimized there. And there is a tropical simplex algorithm. So there's a tropical simplex algorithm that goes along the edges. But the tropical simplex algorithm is the same as the tropical interior point method. So classically, the interior point method travels along a curve in the interior. But that curve, when formulated in the real Prosor series, this algebraic curve tropicalizes to this piece of a tropical algebraic curve, okay? So tropicalization is a technique of taking the classical interior point method and moving it to the boundary so as to identify it with, tropi with the classical simplex method, okay? And, and the, again, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but uh, this has led to a very nice complexity lower bound. I see. That's a very good question. So the question is if n is fixed and r is very large, uh, can I throw out 
columns, right? How to remove redundant columns. So I am not completely sure. I think there are algorithms, but uh, let me point you to the next lecture. So in uh, about 12 minutes, we'll speak about matrix rank. And this question is intimately tied in with calculating the so-called Barvinok rank of your R by N matrix, right? So you're thinking about a, a thousand by uh, five matrix and, uh, and maybe there is a, a low rank situation. And so the study of Barvinok rank is, is important for this. They never lie diagonally? Um, the points never line up diagonally. I see. Well, these are the generic types. So the question was, why do the points, the, uh, the points don't line up diagonally? I'm not completely sure what diagonally means, but maybe on a classical line. Now, in any case, this is a generic situation. So this is a, a situation that's supposed to correspond to a regular triangulation. and. Uh, and this is a generic behavior. So the, te the four red points in this sense are in general position. But you could, of course, you know, pick your, pick your points in special position, right? So you might pick a point here, one, two, three, four, and take the convex hull. Well, then you simply, they all lie on a line segment, right? So you could pick your points in special position, or you might pick this, 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 and off a little bit, you know, then you get, uh, you know, some kind of diagram like this. So this is simply because we're only looking at gen general position configurations. The other questions, either in the room or in the chat box. Yes. That's correct. So the question was, do special positions correspond to subdivisions that are not triangulations? This is correct. So these are triangulations. So these triangulations use 10 maximal simplices. The edges correspond to four-dimensional cells. The uh, polygons correspond to three-dimensional cells that cut through the interior. But if we had such a situation here, there's only four maximal cells that are not simplices and then uh, three four-dimensional cells and no three-dimensional cells. So it's a, a coarser subdivision of delta two times delta three. And from an algorithmic point of view, it's, it's really computing these regular triangulations uh, is, is the way to go. I usually use Macaulay, so regular triangulations uh, of a product of simplices are equivalent to initial monomial ideals of the, the ideal of two by two minors of an R by N matrix. So for me, this is really a, a product of a P2 times P2 in its gray embedding in P11. So this is the prime ideal generated by the two by two minors of a three by four matrix of unknowns. And I usually go quickly into Macaulay too and calculate the initial ideal that gives me the Stanley Reisner representation of the triangulation. But this is only for those who really like commutative algebra. If you don't like commutative algebra, the safe route is to go into polymake and calculate the regular triangulation. OK, if there's no further questions, then we'll take a six-minute break, and we'll continue with ranks of matrices at uh, 3 o'clock.